Amen. Thank you very much. And now I tell you what, tonight we've got the uh, Fifth Sunday singing, and that's just a taste of what you'll hear tonight if you want to come back and be with us tonight. And, and uh, we've got folks lined up to sing, and, and so we'll, uh, we'll just enjoy our time. Yes, children, you're dismissed to Children's Church. And my goodness, what a house full of folks this morning. So thankful for each and every one of you for being here today. We appreciate it so very much. We've been, uh, we've been talking about uh, Real True Revival. Jared touched on it a while ago. Remember those little cards that we put in the bulletin, if you would? We, what we want to encourage you to do is to, to take that and put it someplace where it would be able to remind uh, you to be praying for real, true revival. Jared touched on it a while ago, talking about something that really takes hold and something that happens to the inside of us, that it might be able to work on the outside of us and that people can really and truly see Jesus Christ in and through us. So we want to just, uh, just encourage you to maybe put it on a mirror, on your refrigerator, in your Bible, someplace where you might be able to see it. And every time you glance at that, would you just say a little simple prayer about, Lord, please send revival. One of the things we like to pray, Michelle and I both like to pray this prayer, we always pray for the Holy Spirit to fall like rain. Fall like rain. And that's what we want. That's, that's why we're here today. Amen. I've got a, uh, hopefully I've got a little clip that's going to play for us. I want you to look at this real quick. It's going to last just under a minute. So if you'll, if you'll watch this with me real quick. And uh, I need somebody to turn the lights out down, or turn the lights down low back here if we can, please. Just turn them down low there, David, if you would, please. When was the last time you picked your word up and hugged it? When was the last time you picked your word up and kissed it? It happened in China, you can see. And let me tell you something about uh, what's going on in China. Did you know and realize that Christianity is growing by leaps and bounds in China? But let me tell you what else is happening in China. People are having to meet in secret. People are putting their very lives on the line for getting this book. So I, I want us today to just maybe look at that video clip and to have that in the back of our mind as we speak about today what it means. How, how blessed we are to live in a nation that we can freely pick this book up and... and, and, and Okay, here we go. I might as well just make you mad right off the start, right? How we can take this book and we can get this book and we throw it in the car seat and we don't pick it up again until next Sunday. Or how we take it home and put it on the desk and it stays there and never gets opened up through the week. How that it might be sitting on a bookshelf and never having been opened up. Brothers and sisters, we have God's word. Amen. This it. Now listen to what I tell you, because some of you probably go, well, wait, wait a minute. This is Jesus Christ. It is. 
All you got to do is open up to the book of John and it'll start right off from the front and it'll tell you the word became flesh. God's word. So I want for us today to maybe just have that and think about that. And I want us to be talking about and thinking about what it means to really and truly be in a real true revival. And I want to ask us this question today, how is your faith? How is your faith? Are we, uh, do we really, and, and let, me, let me just preface that with, uh, today that we might be able to, to, to just stop and think about this. You, I'm sure that probably a good many of us are sitting here today, well, the whole reason why I'm here is because I have faith. But I, I really want us to take even a more in-depth perspective. I want us to look even deeper and to, to really ask ourselves the question, uh, how is my faith? What, what is my faith? Am, am I... Is my faith something that I can have? Is my faith something that can be there for me that is going to sustain me through life? I am so proud of so many people that I know who have gone through some very, very hard things in their life. Things that are just unimaginable. And yet they have managed to keep their faith. Not that it was always easy. Not that it was always simple. Not that it was always just something that was... That, that, there was a struggle there, but they managed to hang on. They managed to tie that proverbial knot in the end of the rope and hang on. And keep their faith. And today I want to ask us that same question. What about us? What are we going through? Listen, we've got a church full of folks today, and I'll guarantee you not all of us are having a good time right now. Now, we might be having a good time here. We might be able to have some comfort here. We might be able to have some peace here. All of those things are true and great. But in life, some of the, some of the things that are happening, some of the things that are going on around us are not the greatest in the world. There's some turmoil. It could be some, some uh, problems with money. It could be some problems in relationships. It could be some different problems in, in all kinds of different things. So we know that there's sometimes what happens is that life isn't always a bowl of peaches. Y'all thought I was going to say cherries, right? I like peaches. <laughs> it's not always a bowl full of, of, of peaches. We know that and we understand that and we know that there's something going on, but we look at this clip and we see this clip and we understand that these folks right here could be putting their life on the line for having a Bible. And yet we come to church time after time, week after week, and I wonder, what do we feel, what do we see, when we pick this book up? I'm hoping that what we feel from now on, we pick that book up, we pick Jesus up. Amen. So how's our faith? 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 12, says this. Paul's writing this. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, let's just take that sentence right off from the start, and let's just think about it. Do you realize and understand, as a Christian, you are in a fight? Whether you want to be or not, you've been, you've been drafted, you are in the war. Whether you want to be or not, you are drafted into the war. And what we need in this war is to have faith. Uh, the Satan is running around, and we know the Bible looks, and he says all the time, and says thing, he, what he says, James tells, he says he's like a lion walking around, roaring, looking for whomever he might be able to devour. Do you think that just because you're a Christian, you're safe from that? Do you think that just because you've accepted Jesus Christ, and that you, that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, do you think that you can sit back on your laurels, and you can sit there and go, well, everything's hunky-dory, everything's fine, I'm okay, nothing's going to bother me, and then all of a sudden, this old world jumps up and smacks you right in the mouth. And how many times do we sometimes go, well, I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing all the stuff that's supposed to be done. I'm, I'm doing whatever, the, you know, I'm, as far as I know, I'm doing what the Bible says to do. And yet sometimes things happen to us. Brothers and sisters, 
The Christian life, and I, I just, I'm just going to tell you, the Christian life is not for the wimps. Uh, who was it? Jesse Ventura said not very long ago in a, in a statement that he made, he said, he said, all that Christianity ain't nothing but, a, but for a bunch of weak-minded people. Well, I got news for Jesse Ventura. I'd like for him to walk a real true Christian life for just a little while and then listen to somebody talk like him. And to sit there and take it. And to know that what we are doing is right and true and just. To live our life the way that we're supposed to be living our life for Jesus Christ. Real, true faith. Real faith. Real faith that happens inside. So we're in a fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Go back to that day when you first accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Go back to the day. I'm not talking about when you got the warm fuzzies. I'm talking about when you got, had a real true relationship with Jesus Christ. When something inside of you grabbed hold of you and you knew you were changed. Because, brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, that's what, that's what it is to be saved. That's what it is to give your life to Jesus Christ. It's not about just coming to church. It's not about just reading the Bible. It's not just about saying a prayer. It's not just about putting money in a plate. It's not about singing a song. It is about having a real, true relationship with Jesus Christ. You get that relationship when you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin. You get that relationship when you ask Jesus Christ to help you and, and to realize and understand I need to repent from my sin. That means to turn and walk away from, and it means I'm, gonna, I'm walking away from my sinful nature, and I'm walking toward Jesus Christ. We get that relationship when we know and we understand that we ask him when, he, when we ask him to forgive us of our sin, he will and he does. Then we get to have Jesus Christ live inside of us. That he might guide and direct us in our life. That we can live a Christian life before him. I wished I, wished I had Dr. James Merritt's uh, sermon this morning on the Holy Spirit. I, 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 was set, I had church before church this morning. I was sitting there listening to him talk and listening to him talk about the Holy Spirit. And I was amening and hallelujah and and might have even danced a little bit in the bedroom. That was in the bedroom, okay? But I'm just telling you that uh, it, it was, he had such a great me message. But brothers and sisters, when we go back and we remember that place and that time, when we made that confession, do you remember how you felt? Do you remember the load that was taken off? Do you remember how everything, you, 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 you went down feeling one way and you came up feeling something else? Uh, you, you were looking through the eyes of, of, of the sinful nature when you went down. When you come back up, things were, were brighter. I've seen people go down that had the... Uh, I've seen people go down with this old ugly frown, and I've seen them come up smiling. I'm talking about life change. I'm talking about an experience that really and truly comes inside and changes who you are. That's what Jesus Christ can do. When we know and understand, when we look and we have faith, when we remember what happened to us, we need to remember, listen to me, that faith should not fade. The faith that we had that brought us to a place to where we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, that shouldn't fade. But how many times, I mean, when we, when we look honestly in things and stuff, and we look at our life, and we get into life, and we get in the rut, and we do all these things, all this stuff is going on, all that, and it, it just... the. I mean, w could, could we be honest with ourselves and say that maybe my light's not brightening as, sh as, as bright as it used to? Uh, have I dimmed the light? Have I cut the wick back? You remember the old days where we had to have the kerosene lanterns and things, and the more wick you gave, the brighter the light, right? But we cut our wick back, and the light dims down. How bright is our light shining? How strong is our faith? Do we have faith? Do we have real faith? So today I want us to ask, I want us to look at that and to look at that question. Hebrews chapter 11, 1 tells us, he says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now right off the bat, you're probably going to lose a lot of people right there because they're going to look at you and say, If I can't see it, can't smell it, can't touch it, I don't believe it. We've got an awful lot of people in this world that go by that. There's an awful lot of people that look at that. And I'm going to tell you what. There are some churches that have people in it today that are looking and saying, I'm not sure about all this. 
I'm kind of floating along here. I'm kind of going along. I mean, it's good stuff. There's good fellowship. Really good food when the ladies cook, you know. And Jared, yeah. and Jared when Jared cooks, yes. But, you know, I, I'm not real sure. I'm, I don't know if I've really bought into I don't know if, I've, if this is something that I really take hold of and something that I grasp. The writer of Hebrews tells us now, faith is being sure of what we hope for. What do you hope for? What is your hope? What is your hope? Isn't our hope heaven? Isn't our hope going to a place where we can be with Jesus Christ? Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Isn't that what happens? Didn't Jesus say that, that I'm going away from here and when, I'm go, when I go away, what I'm going to be doing is I'm preparing a place for you, but I'm not going to forget about you. I'm going to come get you, right? That's our hope. Our hope is something that we know and we understand that Jesus Christ is real, he's true. And Jesus Christ is true to his word. And the hope that we have, what we know is that we're going to be able to go to a place called heaven and be with him someday. But while, while we're here in this world, we've got to have some faith. We've got, we got, got to know what we believe. We've got to know that we believe that we believe that we believe, right? So we've got to have faith. We know It's being sure of what we hope for. So how many of you are sure there's a place called heaven? And how many of you are sure you're going there? Man, I got some work to do because not everybody said amen. <laughs> Going to heaven. My goodness, can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing heaven? Can you imagine seeing Jesus Christ face to face? Can you imagine seeing all those loved ones that has gone on before us? Can you, can you really imagine that you get to find out who really and truly wrote the book of Hebrews? Because where this book comes from, we're not real sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some say Paul, others say it was somebody else. But we get to find out who wrote the book of Hebrews. You ever get any questions like that and want to know the answers to it? Are y'all with me this morning? <laughs> huh? Are we awake this morning? Huh? I want to know who wrote the book of Hebrews. I'm going to ask that question, who wrote the book of Hebrews. It's certain of what we do not see. Now, you ever seen Jesus? Well, what is it inside of you? What is it that tells you? What is it that happens to you that helps you to know that he's real and he's true? If not a love, if not for an experience that you had that helps you to understand you see, when we, when we know and we understand, this is a spiritual experience that happens to the physical body. Becoming a Christian is a, phys, is a spiritual experience that happens to the physical body. Christ changes us from the inside out, not from the outside in. And so he works, in, he works on the inside of us. So we know that we're sure of a place called heaven. We know that we get to, by being a Christian, by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life, by living our life that is holy and pleasing before God, we know that we've got a place that we can go called heaven. But we're not real sure about it. I hadn't died yet. Okay? I hadn't had that experience. I know some folks that have. I know some folks that have come back and have talked about their experience while they passed away. Now, some of us can be kind of skeptical about those things and think, well, you know, I am. And I'm sure, you know, you've got you to gotta be measured. But I'm telling you, there's some things that some people have come back and talked about and seen. Uh, you remember the, the little book that came out not very long ago and they made a movie out of it, Heaven is for Real? about a four-year-old boy who, came, who, who showed and talked about the experience that he had. Now, how many four-year-olds do you know could talk about things like that and know what they knew? Heaven is for real. And it's our faith. It is our faith that we get to see, that we know that we're going to get to go and we're going to get to be there with Jesus one of these days. 
Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. He says, what happened here, and I just kind of picked this up because it was kind of a long scripture there, but uh, uh, the disciples have just brought a, a man to the uh, to Jesus and they were not able to cast the demon that was inside of this man out and everything stuff and Jesus kind of was talking to him and things and so he said he replied to them he says because you have so little faith I tell you the truth if you have the if you have faith as small as a mustard seed you can say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move nothing will be impossible for you now right away a lot of times sometimes what happens we go to this place right here we think okay I have faith and my faith is when I say I've got faith in this and faith that this is going to happen and that's going to take place, that it's going to happen because I want it to. It's going to happen because I want it to. Last time I looked, I wasn't in charge. Who is? God's in charge, right? So when Jesus is looking at this, and sometimes so many people take this, and they take it, and it really they kind of take it out of context, and they say, well, just whatever you ask for is supposed to happen. Like we've talked about before, like God's the ATM machine. I put my request in, and you're going to give me my answer, the one I want. So if I've got the faith, I'm sitting here going, well, if I've got the faith, this is going to happen. This is going to take place. It's going to happen just the way that I want it to. And then what happens when it doesn't? God, you lied to me. How can you be real? Didn't your word say that if I asked you for this, this would ha it would happen? So there's a little thing that's got to take place, a little thing that's got to happen. Our will and God's will has got to match up. And when God's in control, when, when we understand that he's in control and we allow him to have control, we will uh, know and understand. It doesn't mean that we're going to always be satisfied with everything. How many of us know and realize Bad things happen to good people. How many of us know and understand that what we consider to be bad things happen to Christian people? Doesn't the Bible say the rain falls on the just and the unjust? Right? We have to live in this world. We have to go through this world. We live in this world, and, and, and I'm just going to, a lot of people want to ask, well, how come, why, how, why is all that stuff, how does that happen, what is that? At the very core of it, Check that. The Lord said, don't say it, so I'm not saying it. We've got to know and we've got to understand that our faith, when we look at our faith, our faith is going to match up with God's will. He's going to bring us to a place to where we're looking and we're seeing down the same lane. We're not looking over any other. What happens when you get to looking at the other lane? You, do, you, do, you have, do you know you have a tendency to drive where you're looking? How many of you know that? I'm going down the road, and I see this group of cows, and I go, boy, that's a good-looking set of cows. <laughs> right? I got a yanker back in the right lane. We have a tendency to go where we're looking. Brothers and sisters, our faith tells us to seek Jesus. Our faith says to see the cross. Our faith says to continue to move this way, to go this way, and that's where we're supposed to be. We need to stay in our lane. So if we have faith like a mustard seed, our faith, even as small as a mustard seed, and the reason why Jesus used the mustard seed at that particular time is because it was the smallest seed known to man at that time. Very, have you ever seen a mustard seed? I mean, you can put some in the palm of your hand, and you're liable to have a thousand mustard seed in the palm of your hand. That's how small it is. And Jesus looked at him and says, if you have the faith of a mustard seed... But listen, this mountain that needs to be moved is going to have to be a part of God's will. Not just simply because you want it to move. Not just simply because I don't think it needs to be there anymore. Paul said, I've prayed three times for this whatever, this thorn in my flesh to be removed. And as far as I know, it never did get removed. Removed. 
Well, if it was Paul's will that this, this thorn be removed and it stayed there, then what happened? See, God had that thorn there for a reason. It's a reminder. It was a reminder for Paul to help him to stay the course, to keep the faith. So, brothers and sisters, our faith can and, and will, it is true. Our faith can do many things. I have said it over and over again. I still believe it to this day. I believe that no water county can be different than what it is. I believe that there can be jobs come to this county. I think that things can turn around. I think that we, instead of being one of the, one of the least amount of counties in the state, I think that we can be one of the best counties in the state. Amen. I really do. But let me tell you what, this, what happens and what takes place. When we get our focus on Jesus Christ and do the things that Jesus Christ wants us to do, from the top of the leadership down to the bottom of the leadership, things change. Amen. And I believe that. I want the governor of Oklahoma, whoever it happens to be at that time, I want them to land at this little airport out here at Nowata, and I want them to step off that helicopter, and I want them to ask our leaders in, 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 in Nowata, what's going on? What happened? And you want to know what I want them to say? Jesus. Jesus happened. That's what happened. If you never read a, a, a book called This Present Darkness, I'd encourage you to read it. This Present Darkness. It's a good book. It really does give a picture of how Satan can put a cloud over a place and cause it to, to not do well. But it also gives us hope and helps us to know and understand Jesus Christ is real and things can change. And if we, if, just, now just, just stop and think with me just for a second. If this doesn't make sense to you or whatever you're saying, well, why are you saying things like that? I know what Jesus done to me. I know the change that Jesus made in me. I know the dark cloud that was over my life. I know the direction that I was headed. I know the things that I was involved in, the things that I was doing. None of them good. And yet when Jesus got hold of me, things changed. Jesus is in the life-changing business, brothers and sisters. If we don't believe that... If we don't believe that, then we might as well just shut the doors, turn out the lights, go home, and don't worry about coming back. Jesus is in the life-changing business. Our faith, keeping our faith, even something as small. And when we look at this, we say, well, just how much faith does that take? It takes, it takes the amount that it takes in order to get the job done. Amen? Where's my brother I'm forgetting his name real quick. Where's my brother? I'm, I got I to gotta brag on him a little bit. I'm going to embarrass him real good. Stand up, brother. Come on. Stand up. Come on. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I want you to look at this young man. Just this past, this past week, right? This, this was yesterday. 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 All right. This young man right here, yesterday, walked up to a, a set of dumbbells. And he had on there, or this bar, and he had on there 525 pounds. He stepped up under that, and everybody know what a squat is? Everybody, anybody ever squatted, done, done, you know, a squat's where you go down, go like this right here? I can't even hardly get down that far anymore. <clears throat> They videoed it, and he done a proper squat. You know, some people go like this and call it good, you know. That's not a squat. A squat's a 90-degree angle to the floor. Thigh and knee, 90-degree angle to the floor. 525 pounds. Now that I've embarrassed you good, now, 
Don't you think that he had to have a little bit of faith that he could do it before he ever even stepped up under it? He had to be, he had to be able to look up under there. He had to be able to look at that thing, and he had to be able to say, you know what? I believe I can do this. I've got the faith that I'm going to be able to. Did you know they didn't even jump up out of the chair to help him? He went down and come right back up. I told him, I said, I think he could have done another 25 more. <laughs> Listen, the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. Amen? It can move 525 pounds. <laughs> In order for us to have strong faith, we've got to believe. And you think, well, now, what, doesn't that kind of go hand in hand? But, yeah, well, you know, may, maybe so if we look at it. But you got to believe. He had to believe that he could do it. He had to believe that he could squat 525 pounds before he ever attempted it. Amen? Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 27, says, As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and asked them, Do you believe, uh, and Jesus asked them this, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I am able to do this? And wouldn't you say they had a little faith? Because they did call him son of David. Now that's reference in the Bible as to who the Messiah is going to be. He was going to come out of the lineage of David. That was one of the deals in the Old Testament that was telling us this is how we can know who the Messiah is. Now wouldn't that say, that? I mean that suggests to us that they, he, they've got faith. But then Jesus asked them this question, do you believe that I can do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. When they done it, they were able to see. Their blind eyes were open, and they could see. He said, then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, will it be done to you? And it says, and their sight was restored. According to their faith, it was done to them. Now, brothers and sisters, today, this morning, I'm telling us and I'm trying to suggest to us that we, our faith has got to be something that has got to be concrete. It's got to be solid. We need to have faith. Not only do we just need to have faith, I think a lot of times it's so, it's so easy for us to say, well, okay, I know, uh, okay, God and, and, and Jesus and, and, and Holy Spirit, okay, I got that part, you know, but I don't know if, you know, does God really care about all of these things? And I'm going to tell you, God cares about everything. If you've got a splinter in your finger this morning, God cares about that. And that's not, I'm not just saying that just to be kind of... I mean, that's real and true. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe God cares for us to the nth degree. That's how much He knows us. That's how close He wants to be to us. How's our faith? Where is our faith? In order for us to have a strong faith, we need to have total trust. We need to have total trust. It never ceases to amaze me that people can look at me and say, there is no God. I don't trust in stuff like that. I don't believe in stuff like that. And they will buy a ticket on a jet plane and fly it across the country. Because they believe that that jet's going to stay in the air. They trust that it's going to stay in the air. They believe and they trust that it's going to take off safely. They believe and trust that it's going to stay in the air until it gets to the certain point that it's supposed to be. And they believe and trust it's going to land safely. But yet we'll argue with you up and down that there cannot be a creator in this world.
It never ceases to amaze me that we can all step on an elevator and we get in there and we're just like this in the elevator because we're in a hurry and we don't want to wait. We'll crunch in there like a bunch of sardines and think, man, this thing cannot hold one more person. And yet we scrunch one more in there. Everybody goes, <gasps> right? And trust that it's going to take us to the floor that we're supposed to be on. I've often thought that riding on an elevator, that, you know, if it started to fall, if all of a sudden just before it hit the ground, I went. <laughs> Y'all saw how high I got? That was pretty good, right? <laughs> I don't think it'd much, make much difference, would it? You're going to put your faith and trust in something. You got in vehicles this morning and drove your vehicles here believing and trusting that it was going to start, believing and trusting that it was going to drive, it was going to drive and stay in the lane, right? <laughs> you believe and trust that when you pushed on the brake, it was going to stop, right, to get you here. We've got to have total trust. Luke chapter 7, verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all, these, all this in, in the hearing of the, when Jesus finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogues. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to, uh, to say to him, Lord, uh, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. That one to come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Amen. Found the servant well. He trusted that what Jesus said was going to come true. He trusted that all Jesus had to do was say, be well. And he was well. You see, for us today, brothers and sisters, the challenge for us is not different. The challenge for us is, is not changed. We still, we still need these things. These are things that are still very relevant to us. In order for us to be who we're supposed to be, in order for us to be able to do the things that we need to do, in order for us to be the church, this is what we need. We need Jesus, and we need to know that we have our faith and that our faith is real and that our faith is true. Last thing I want to cover with you. All of these things can happen. All of this stuff, we can, we can have our faith. We can check our faith. We can do these, do these different things and stuff. But I want to guarantee you this. I want you to know this. I want you to walk out of these doors today knowing this, that as we amen and as we hallelujah this and everything works out great, I'll guarantee you because we've talked about faith today, your faith will be tested. It's kind of like praying for patience. Don't pray for patience because you will be tested. Okay? you got to go to Walmart sometime. Right? <laughs> Your faith's going to be tested. When we go out, when we go out, know it. Whether it is through somebody or something, our faith will be tested. James chapter 1, starting at verse 2, James writes this. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not 
lacking anything. When do you learn something? Now, I, I, I've, I've used this probably till y'all are probably tired of hearing it. But when you, when you learn, how do you learn something? By failing it. True. You got to do it. Right? In order, in order to really and truly learn something, you've got to sometime put it, put it to work. Right? You can sit in the classroom. You can have it, you can have it and, and have it in your mind and do all of these things and stuff until you actually put it into practice. That's when you learn something. Jared will tell you that he is so tired of, of trying to learn me how to use this computer. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just like, I, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I, I mean, we're doing good to do what we do here right now. We've got to put it into practice. Brothers and sisters, you've got to put your faith into practice. Because in order for your faith to do any good, it's got to be practiced. And when it gets practiced, it's going to be challenged. And that's when we're going to learn some things. We'll learn things about ourselves, and we'll learn things about God. It never ceases to amaze me that when, 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 we, when we put our faith in God, how he comes through in what he does for us. See, we don't always get to see that great big old picture. We wish we could, right? Don't we wish we could see that great big picture? We don't always know why certain things have happened. But sometimes it takes those certain things in order to help bring people to a certain place. Sometimes it takes us to getting to a certain point and to a certain place where God can look and he can say, okay, now, now I can do something. Now you can watch me work. Now you can learn something about who I am. See, being a Christian isn't going to always be easy. It's not going to be without its challenges. But God is God. He is still on His throne. He is still in charge. And if you take your book, your word... If you take Jesus and put him right here, your faith will grow. And when it gets tested, you'll have your faith. When it gets challenged, you'll have your faith. I'm going to end with this little story right here. I've told and shared this story before, but I want to just one more time help us to put it in perspective. We saw a while ago the the video of those folks in China who got a copy of God's Word. And you saw they were like children running to get those books. And what did they do after they got them? Hugged them kissed them, smelled them. And they were just they were just in in Southeast Asia there was a little church of people, a little group of people, a little church family who were meeting and they were meeting in a what they thought was a secret place. They had been meeting for quite a while like this. But one time in their meeting, there were some soldiers who busted in through the door. Caught them with their Bibles, red-handed. They couldn't deny it. They couldn't run. There was no place to go. They were there and they were caught. These soldiers told them that it was treason for them to have this book. It was treason for them to believe the way that they were believing. There was no God, and he was about to prove it to them. 
So he takes this book, this Bible, and he throws it out in the middle of the floor on the, on the floor. And he looks at all of them and he says, you can walk out this door and live if what you will do is spit on that Bible and denounce God. Slowly, one by one, people walked up, spit on the Bible, and denounced God and walked out the door. Until this little 15-year-old girl walked up to the Bible and knelt down by that Bible and picked it up and wiped the spit off of that Bible on her dress. And she says, I can't. They put a gun to her head and they killed her. How is your faith? What do you believe? Brothers and sisters, it is so important for us to know. As sad as it is that that young lady lost her life in this world, can you imagine the welcome home that she got when she got to heaven? Can you imagine the angels of heaven looking at this young lady? I can imagine them folding their wings, if they have wings, in reverence and honor of someone who said, my faith is the utmost important thing to me. That's how important it is to have faith. That's how important it is for us to know and to understand that we, we need to check ourselves. We need to know. James says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Stand the test. Check your faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. Fight the good fight of faith.